It is my pleasure today to welcome back to the Samuel Andreev podcast, the pianist, musicologist, and professor at City University London, Ian Pace. Ian, thank you so much for coming on to the show again. Thank you. The conversation that we recorded previously was, in fact, one of my most popular podcasts, so I'm very glad that we have the opportunity to do this again. And we decided that we would focus this time on the topic of music in higher education, which is a topic that I know is of tremendous importance to a lot of people who are following the podcast and my YouTube channel. In fact, I get questions all the time from young musicians who are trying to sort out what they're going to do with their lives, what would be the most appropriate course for them to take. And a question I hear quite often, and I'd love to have your thoughts on this, is should I go to a university to study music? Should I go to a conservatory? Would I be better off studying privately? What are the benefits of all of these different options? What are the specific benefits of studying in a university in 2022, given what the job market looks like for musicians? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. I just wonder if I could just say something first to point out that I'm speaking here in a personal capacity, not on behalf of my department. Uh, I'm, and I'm not speaking about uh, the situation specific to my own department, but rather about uh, higher education as a whole on the basis of having worked in multiple institutions and having a lot of interactions with people in, in different places. So traditionally, the distinction between a university and a conservatoire was reasonably clear. A conservatoire was a place for focused training on an instrument or a voice with lots of opportunities to practice that together with others. Um, maybe a little bit of what we might call academic content within there, but the focus very definitely on the practical side. Whereas a university degree was for those who wanted a broader, more holistic approach to music, um, not necessarily uh, so specifically geared towards training people for a professional career. And the conductor, Nicholas Arnoncourt, has spoken quite critically of what he sees as the developments um, that came following the French Revolution and following the forming of the Paris Conservatoire, whereby people learnt uh, a much narrower approach to playing an instrument or singing without uh, the wider holistic and wider, wider sort of cultural background that would traditionally have uh, accompanied musical education. And he certainly saw that, did not see that as a positive stage forward. What everyone thinks about that, um, the boundaries separating universities and conservatoires have become more blurred in recent times, depending on in which country one's speaking. Um, and I think that the difference between going to a university or Musikhochschule in Germany is much clearer than that uh, if one went to a university or conservatoire in Britain or perhaps Australia or some of the European countries. Uh, well, something I would say about that. So I, I studied composition at the Paris Conservatory, and when I entered that program, it was the old uh, Prix du Conservatoire system, which had no particular equivalent in other European nations. So a decision was made partway through, I think it was in my third year, to change to a bachelor master system and to harmonize the, di the diploma with other European diplomas. In reality, it ended up changing virtually nothing about the content of the program, which was kind of strange. So I ended up with a completely different diploma than I would have otherwise. Um, and I had to do an additional year in order to get the, the master's degree. But besides that, there was really no fundamental difference between the sort of training I had uh, under that system and what I would have had otherwise. So it was, it, it was a, an attempt to sort of shoehorn this program into something that would be understandable within a, a more academic context. And so in order to do that, we had to write a, uh, a short thesis, but it was really, you know, it was not particularly uh, uh, in depth and it was, it was really sort of something that we did on the side and in a kind of, it wasn't central to what we were doing. Well, something of that process has also occurred here in the UK. Uh, at the time when I was a student, uh, and I was at a specialist music school, so many people were going on to study music in one form or another in higher education, the common options if one was going to conservatoire then was to do either what was called a graduate course or a performer's course. The graduate course was a diploma which was deemed equivalent to a degree, whereas the performance course was just a diploma and had much less in the sense of academic content there. Doing what would be called a BMUS course, uh, an actual full degree course, was relatively rare. Now it's far more common to do that at conservatoires, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, 
How exactly this has affected the curriculum is something I haven't researched enough to be able to have a view on. But uh, I think it's certainly meant that uh, the conservatoires have had to boost to some extent uh, the wider academic aspects of what they offer in order simply for what they offer to be validated as a degree because they often validated by external universities. So increasingly some have gained their own degree awarding powers. Um, so with that comes the need to employ more academic musicians, for want of a better term, in conservatoires. And at the same time as that has happened, uh, we've seen a difference in the status of practitioners within university departments and the role of practice there. And this is quite a complicated situation. So traditionally, composers would frequently get jobs in universities and could move through the conventional academic career structure that way, but not so much performers. Uh, performers were often adjunct teachers, and to many, in many cases still are, um, who were often hourly paid for doing very specific focused uh, performance teaching, which was offered as a relatively small part of a degree rather than uh, a fundamental focus of it. So people would come knowing that they're going to do in the conventional sense of the word, an academic degree, where they could do some performance, but they weren't fundamentally doing uh, a degree about performance. Composers were also viewed by universities as, in some sense, researchers, or research active staff. If they produced compositions, uh, that was seen as fulfilling what was necessary uh, in order to be, yeah, in, in order to be seen as somehow equivalent to what those who produce monographs, uh, journal articles, give conference papers, and so on do. Now, again, this varies a lot by country, but the situation has changed quite significantly in the UK, partially as a result of um, an institution for assessing research uh, called now the Research Excellence Framework, previously the Research, and Ass research Assessment Exercise, um, which. Uh, came about uh, in the 1980s, I think, and it's gradually been adapted across various disciplines in terms of the extent to which they can accept practice-based submissions. What the REF does is they look at a selection of submissions from each department in the country and then allocate, they assess these and then they allocate research funding on the basis of how they uh, gauge the quality of that work. Um, Previously, for a short time, compositions were seen as the only really viable type of practice-based output. But then the guidelines changed. Uh, as I say, in parallel with uh, changes that happened in other artistic disciplines as well, so that one could now submit other types of things. You could submit uh, recordings of performances. Uh, you could submit really any type of artistic output to, uh, which, of which there exists the equivalent of a hard copy. So there's there's some sort of record of it. You couldn't just say that something happened one time. You'd need at least to have a film or a recording of it. So it could be a sound installation. It could be an example of some studio engineering, potentially. Um, it could be a performance, a series of performances. Uh, it could be something like uh, a piece of online software about uh, some work and so on and so forth. Mm. The, well, the whole I, point I was to try and make this as, as flexible as it could be and then integrate uh, practitioners more deeply into the research culture of universities. But I think that's mm. a double-edged sword. Mm. Well, I know quite a, quite a few performers that have uh, been engaging with uh, innovations in instrument building, for example. The flutists who are trying out new models of quarter-tone flutes, for example, or, or oboists who, have, who are working with new fingering systems for oboes. And uh, no doubt there are many pianists who are doing similar things as well. And, um, and commissioning composers to write work specifically for these new instruments, and that becomes a, a research project. So that seems to be something that's relatively recent then in, the, in, a, in an academic context. Well, that's where I think uh, the complications really begin. Um, when practice-based outputs of whatever type are judged as research, it's generally thought this is not the same thing as just judging them for their artistic merits. Hmm. And in the case of the REF, there are three key criteria which are employed, uh, significance, originality, and rigor. And certainly in the case of composition, rigor is a very difficult uh, 
yardstick to use. And here is where I would go back to the sort of thinking about composition in university that was articulated most obviously by Milton Babbitt back in the late 1950s in his famed article, which was called, it wasn't his own title, was called Who Care If You Listen? Who Cares If You Listen? The composer uh, as specialist. Yes, right. exactly. And yes. he was saying that really what people should be doing is working on new possibilities, new innovations, new techniques for composition, and whether or not uh, they get an audience in, at least in the short term. These were about developing the whole language of music. This was about a bigger contribution to music as a research-based field. And music as a kind of autonomous science that, that has its own internal modes of organization and development also. Uh, that in, and the, the, the need for that also to be, let's say, sheltered from the vagaries of the market, that's very much a central part of his argument. Absolutely, and I'm completely with him on uh, the value of allowing species of musical practice to develop without having to be subject to short-term market forces. I think if all were subject to that, the possibilities would become much more limited. However, the question is, when do you gauge whether this research is valuable, has proved valuable? In terms of what Babbitt was researching and others around him were researching back at that time, what is the evidence now that this has affected some sort of major shifts, uh, major developments in musical composition, other than in some very small circles? I'm not really sure if the evidence is there. And there's got to be mm. some point at which you start asking questions about the value of research, other than how it will be gauged by the people who are most obviously self-interested, so those mm. who are actually practicing it. Mm. And Babbitt's views in modified form, uh, I think, echoed in a lot of the discourse that exists now amongst what are called practice researchers in universities, uh, that they are thinking of what they're doing in a relatively autonomous fashion and often appealing to other practitioners or other people within generally what's a very small realm of new music to validate their work. Um, but the question comes of... Uh, at what point, uh, in what way can it be more widely validated? Um, which I think is a fair thing to ask of most types of research in any discipline. At what point do we say that this is having a wider impact that benefits more people than just the ones who obviously stand to gain because that's where their job is? Well, it's, it's of course a complicated question because it, it, it stands to reason that the vast majority of research is not going to have any particular consequences. You know, it's probably something on the order of 98% of it is not going to have a tangible impact. But in order to get to the 1% or the 2% that will have an impact, you have to allow people to try things and, and have them be rejected and have them not lead anywhere. So that would be presumably the, the argument for that. Yes, and that's an argument I can certainly buy. But I wonder whether those sorts of aims are really what's going on necessarily in some of this work, or whether it's often about a way of presenting artistic work, even if I was to be a bit harsher, a way of spinning artistic work to give it more of a surface veneer of research as the term is understood in other fields. And so in the case of composition, this might mean giving a privilege to that that, as you say, involves new instruments or new instrumental techniques, or involves extremely systematic approaches to composition, or uses a lot of new technology or things like that. Um, the problem I have with that, and of course I understand the point, it doesn't actually speak to the content of the work or what the work does. It, it talks about some of the material aspects of the work, some of the processes by which the work is made. And it may even talk about uh, innovations in, in, in instrument building or, or things of that sort. But it doesn't touch the substance of the piece itself. And the substance of the piece itself may in fact be completely banal, but it may feature an aspect here or there that is superficially new. So. There's, there's something I want to relate this to, which is that I was asked to join a new federation of composers in France about a year ago, um, and I read through the prospectus and the sort of description of what this federation was intended to do, and right in the first paragraph, it was clear that they were, um, they were interested in promulgating a vision of musique contemporaine, new music, 
And their definition of that was it's music that has a component of innovation and a component of research. And music that does not do that in some manner or another presumably does not fall under the rubric of musique contemporaine. So I refuse to join this federation, partly because I don't like the instrumentalization of the term musique contemporaine in France and the way that that term has, uh, has tended to exclude large areas of repertoire. Um, and secondly, I'm suspicious of the incursion of what I think is essentially administrative language into the artistic field. So innovation, that's not an easy thing to qualify with respect to a musical composition. Where does the innovation fall exactly? Uh, is it something substantive or is it something far more superficial? Absolutely. Can some things be novelty rather than rather than sort of more meaningful innovation, which has deeper consequences? Yes. It can lead to gimmickry, in other words, if it's Absolutely. Unfair. And I certainly would not want to subscribe wholly to a view of music history which always privileges the most iconoclastic work there is. There, through many centuries, there's been a lot of important work that has had an integrative relationship to existing traditions, existing conventions, rather than feeling the need to radically overthrow them. And I certainly do not believe that that work is lesser as a result. And as you suggest, in the, in the very concept of new music or musique contemporaine, uh, there's often been a tendency to, yes, privilege that sort of innovation. Um, but this has taken on a new form when it comes to sort of music in the university, I think. Um, because um, it's it's not easy, as I think many will know, to to generate a viable income from being a composer alone. Many people need something more secure than that. And nowadays, a university job is one of the most obvious ways of doing that. Certainly in this country, that's the case. And that, that provides all sorts of opportunities. Uh, it can... Uh, enable one to sort of access particular sources of funding, which will enable one to compose, to, ha to make, have performances mounted, to make recordings and so on. So it's a good position to be in. Mm -hmm. But that, it, because of these ways that, that composers gain uh, those, their reputations and their positions on the basis of how well their work will be gauged as research, I think this is creating a new type of aesthetic economy of prestige. Um, one which uh, certainly distinctly favours certain approaches to composition and much less so others. And I wonder if I can just bring this into performance Absolutely. as well, because we're talking a lot about com composition, mm -hmm. but uh, that's only one of various species of practice that exist mm -hmm. in universities. Um, there are a handful of performers who have full academic positions, of whom I'm one. Um, from all I know, the, the majority of those, at least who are on research contracts, uh, so they're not on contracts which are just about teaching and they're not expected to produce research, the majority of those um, are either working on new music or they're working on historically informed performance. Um, two areas which I think it could be fairly said are quite niche. And where this gets really complicated is in how this conflicts uh, with some of the demands and desires of uh, new student cohorts here. If we're to have research active academics engaged in teaching, you can find, well, if you if want to look, again, I'm, I'm speaking about the UK because I know the figures here, but I think some of these will be mirrored elsewhere. Um, the total number of students coming to university departments to study music degrees, uh, contrary to some perceptions, has not gone down in the last uh, decade or so. I mean, I've analysed the figures for these. It's marginally gone up, actually, not by a large amount, but marginally gone up. But what has changed is the types of degrees uh, that they are doing. I mean, successful university degrees fall into a few categories, and then there's a few other ones that, that exist in exceptional cases. There are traditional what are often called BMUS degrees, which take a broad approach to music, often involve a bit of performance and composition as well, uh, but are just called music. They don't come with any other qualifier. There are popular music degrees, which is a very big growth area. There are degrees in music technology, music production, and so on and so forth. And one of the big growth areas recently has been musical theatre, uh, which is a very extensive field. Um, and then there's a few other things uh, that you get uh, 
more isolated numbers of things in uh, you get this, like music and moving image, music and film, music and video, and so on, or studies as a music business, or that's that sort of thing. And it, it sounds but, as though it sounds as though the work itself is becoming somewhat more peripheral. In, in a, some in ways, what, what I was going to draw from that, that in amongst these various categories, the traditional music degrees are the ones in which numbers have been falling and the other areas have been growing. So we're now getting increasingly large cohorts of students who are more interested in studying popular music, in studying sound engineering, studying musical theatre, all very practice-focused uh, fields. Um, whereas... Uh, the sorts of expertise which are likely to get someone a research position in university are often likely to be in areas which are quite distinct from those. So there are very few cases that I know of, say, of successful active popular musicians who've also got uh, research contracts at universities, or not that many of performers playing a more sort of standard classical repertoire either. I mean, a few, but not, not many. It's usually only if they're doing something particularly novel with that, that that might be possible, or if they're engaged in historically informed performance, as I say. So what this creates is a huge disjunction between the research expertise of staff and the wishes of students. And this, th this is a real problem in many departments. And I wonder, and I've, I've been an advocate of assessing practice as research. I've written on this subject and I certainly believe in it, but I'm now starting to think whether it wouldn't make more sense to have a different framework for assessing practice, which doesn't try and drag over the categories from other types of research to fields where it may not be so appropriate. And in such a way that we can start to integrate a wider variety of practitioners into into academia without them feeling like uh, second-class citizens within that, which at the moment it's quite difficult to do. I'd like to circle this back again to Milton Babbitt, who we spoke about earlier. Uh, Babbitt, I think, is extremely important in this context for a number of reasons. One of them is that he had the insight that the composer needed to be able to pursue music as an entirely autonomous form of research with its own codes, its own internal mode of development. And in order for it to do that and not be completely destroyed by the marketplace and the need to be appealing, then the, the ideal place for composers to be was the university. He, he, he compares the university to the patronage system of old in which composers would be supported by members of the European aristocracy. And since that option was no longer available in the 1950s and beyond in the United States, the idea was, well, the universities can now fill this role, effectively protecting composers and, uh, and providing them with some form of guaranteed employment. But one of the byproducts of that approach, of course, is that in order to fit into the university mold, the composers had to be able to speak this administrative language. They had to be able to frame everything they were doing in terms of research, but more specifically, in, in terms that a university administrator would be able to understand. So what that means is that Composers whose work fits more easily into those sorts of discourses where you can formalize the procedure, where you can talk in very specific technical terms about this, this piece is doing this and here's how it does it and so on. Um, other sorts of composition simply, simply don't allow that. It doesn't, it's not relevant. And so there's a, there's a real risk there, I think, that um, whether it's intentional or not, those other sorts of approaches, which may be harder to define or harder to formalize, um, may end up being completely marginalized in that sort of a, an environment. So what would you say about that? Well, I think you have to look at uh, Babbitt's work and Babbitt's ideas there in the context of the particular time and some of the values that were around then. Uh, um, the musicologist Nicholas Cook has written about this, how in the early post-war era in the United States, there were strong currents of what we call scientism within universities and science was viewed as a sort of hard research, whereas the arts and humanities less so. They were seen as more soft subjects and both then and now and in various parts of the world, this has also unfortunately come to have a gendered aspect as well, um, and which is sometimes reflected in the intakes of students on these different types of courses. But still, I mean, in this country, we had uh, a major cabinet minister about six, seven years ago, telling students, don't do the arts and humanities. They're a waste of your time. You'll be, uh, you won't be helping your ability to get a job. And lots of other rhetoric from politicians has 
echoed that sort of view that the arts and humanities are some sort of decadent luxury and uh, not to be taken that seriously in, in other respects. What, what, so, do, you, what do you think the, is their motivation for saying that, though? Why, why would you make a statement like that publicly? Well, if, if I can come to that in a second, because I just, I just want to add there that Babbitt was responding to a particular climate where in order to be taken seriously, in a university, you had to frame what you did in terms which resembled a science, I would say. Now, and that is a quite narrow view of what research is. Uh, and it's a narrow view if you apply it to any other artistic discipline as well. I don't see why, for example, um, let's say a work of musical theatre, and I mean musical theatre in the sense of what you might associate with Broadway in the West End. I don't mean things like Cargill or Schnabel or so on. Um, but work of that that involves quite a lot of sort of subversion of genre and all sorts of other conventions. Uh, I don't see why that is any less research-like uh, than a very systematic form of composition or one that uses extensive amounts of technology. But, this, but it becomes harder for performers in this respect. Uh, again, if performers, once again, if they're using a lot of technology or, as in my case, if they're simply uh, premiering a lot of new compositions and recording those, that can just about be presented as research. But innovative and meaningful new approaches to the very business of music interpretation, which I still think is fundamental, uh, are much harder to uh, frame in such terms so they will convince other people. And I think the Babbitt approach uh, could lead to a certain university ghettoization, which of all people, Pierre Boulez was one of the biggest critics. And for all the critics of Boulez as an ivory tower figure, I think people underestimate the extent to which he was involved in initiatives to try and engage a wider public with new music. Not in a way that particularly compromised the stuff. I mean, compromise is the last term I would associate with Boulez, but he was concerned about it as a public art form. I think very much so, and whether it was the Domain Musicale or his uh, things in the Roundhouse in London, this this testifies to that. But I don't think there was very much of that going on in the Babbitt circle at all. But I think definitions of research, and actually the definitions that even the Research Excellence Framework here uses are a lot broader than those that would apply to Babbitt. Where things get more tricky here is whether the people who are doing the internal sifting within institutions, to what extent they're prepared to take on board those broader definitions, or to what extent they think we, uh, it's better for us to play safe and go for the more scientific type of work. And I say, yes, this does definitely favour certain types of work uh, more than others in a way that I think is very problematic. And, it all, and once again, I think it also creates uh, a big chasm between the interests and even the self-interests of some academics and many of the aspirations of students. What I'd also like to, to bring up with that, so I work with hundreds of young composers, uh, uh, mostly online. I do a lot of online teaching, but I also teach in, in, a, in, a, in an academic context and also in, in conservatories. And one of the comments that I hear very, very often is students saying, well, I don't particularly want to study in a university, but I should probably do it because realistically speaking, I, I would have a higher likelihood of finding employment if I do that. Whereas if I simply study privately, then there's of course no guarantee that I'll be employable at the end of that. So there's this perception that, well, at least if I have a university degree of some kind, then that could open doors to employment later down the road. But they're doing it somewhat um, against their intuitions, I think, is, is the impression I get. And there's this kind of sense of resignation. It's, well, I'm not sure I really belong in a university. I'm a, I'm a composer. I'm, I'm not necessarily keen on framing my work in that manner. But I have to be pragmatic. And I certainly understand that. And I certainly understand the extraordinary difficulty of launching a career as a composer in that you would want to put every possible advantage on your side if you're trying to enter a field like that. But what are the limits? At what point do we say, this really isn't right for me. I'm not sure that this is appropriate for the sort of work I'm going to be doing. Knowing that, of course, there's an enormous risk involved in going it alone, studying privately, or even studying at a conservatory where you're not necessarily going to have a professional degree at the end of it. Well, I would relate that to some wider sort of social developments. Uh, again, very strong in this, in this country, but uh, to some extent elsewhere, to do with... Uh, major increases in the percentage of the population going on to higher education in any form. 
when I was a student in the mid 80s, it would be, I think, around 20% of the population. Now it's close to 50%, which was the aim of the, the Labour government uh, that was in power from 1997 to 2010. They wanted to get about half the population going to university. I think that's a very good and laudable aim. But that inevitably, if, if it's not accompanied by major changes in the nature of secondary education in terms of what's preparing people for university, that will change the nature of universities and what they provide. And at the same time, having that number of graduates coming out uh, places uh, a greater necessity on simply having a degree of some type in order to be to get a job in all sorts of fields of employment. Uh, if if half the population have a degree, then uh, those without will will possibly be seen as more in a second class than would have been the case when it was only twenty percent. Uh, and in the case. In the case of composition specifically, um, historically, there isn't a, a strong tradition, I think, of um, having to demonstrate specifically a music degree or specifically a composition-focused music degree in order to be a successful composer. And actually, in, in continental Europe, as compared to the United States, there isn't such a strong tradition of major composers teaching in universities. Uh, uh, that wasn't the case for people like Boulez and Stockhausen, uh, say, or not many others of that generation of composers born in the 1920s. Um, but now, as well, as I said earlier, uh, there is a strong and quite justified perception that uh, the best way to be able to have a secure income as a composer or some other types of practitioner, I mean, this evolves this applies to some people who are sound artists, who are improvisers and so on. The best way to do that is to find a university job. And that's usually dependent upon having a doctorate now. Not everywhere, but uh, often it is. And we've seen the growth of composition doctorates and practice-based doctorates. And once again, this is something I've got a lot of mixed views on. Mm. I did my own doctorate quite late uh, because I came into, into higher education uh, only in my mid-30s after pursuing a performance career before that, which I still pursue, but uh, mm. um, I do a lot more in the university now. And I never wanted to do a practice-based doctorate myself. Uh, I knew eventually I'd have to do one. Um, but I mean, I, I did a mixture of uh, historical and analytical music, musicology. It was as much a history doctorate as it was a music one in some ways. Um, uh, now, that was not because I didn't think practice-based uh, doctorates uh, could be worthwhile. I think there's many cases that are, but I think it's a very mixed bag. And there's a very interesting essay by two composers in a volume that I edited, a volume on researching and writing about contemporary art and artists, uh, looking at uh, the different requirements of composition doctorates. To what extent do composers have to submit uh, a written element? Most do, except at a few places, but the nature of it can vary uh, considerably. In some cases, it can be just a rather incidental commentary on the work that they're submitting as part of a portfolio. In other cases, it should amount to a much more fleshed out and rigorous examination of the whole compositional process in which they're engaged, mm. uh, with, with potentially implications for, for that others could take up and make use of as well. But practice varies very greatly. And in the case of performance-based doctorates, I'd say even more so. Um, I've seen some very good performance-based doctorates, and I've seen some very questionable ones, ones, in my view. Uh, sometimes you'll find some people will just continue what they're doing anyhow as a performer and keep a performance diary, and they'll pad out the commentary with a lot of often rather ordinary just comments saying about how they spent this day and that day working on that passage and they had to face this question and do that. I mean, articulating those and making them available is valuable, but often the results are nothing which I don't think is re relatively self-evident there. Yeah. And you get a lot of uh, collaboration is a big theme in there. So mm -hmm. I've lost track of the number of papers, doctors and other things I've read, which talk about going to visit X or Y composer to play their piece to them. And they thought it should be played one way. The performer thought one way, uh, which was a different, and they both discussed it and they arrived at some compromise in right. the middle. I mean, I've, <laughs> Earth I've sometimes read hundreds of pages which tell me <laughs> tell me that in the end. And I suppose I just don't think that's on a par with uh, 
For example, someone's sort of <laughs> philological, philological research into medieval manuscripts or something like that. Right. Which, yes. Or, or or someone studying condensed matter physics. Right. It's not. It's yes. not really. Yeah. It's, it's not really equivalent. So I mean, so that question of parity is one that I come back to in uh, in lots of things that I write and say about the subject. That if we absolutely, I think we should be prepared to entertain the idea of practice can be research, and that doesn't just mean a commentary around practice or a commentary coming out of practice. It can actually mean the idea that research is embodied in the practice itself. Mm. I believe in that fundamentally, but um, I think one has to ask the questions uh, of how what makes this equivalent to other forms if those people who are doing them mm. are asking for the same levels of prestige and same position mm -hmm. in academic environments. So I think it's a perfectly fair question. One of the things I want to relate that to, I've, I've occasionally taken to saying somewhat provocative things on, on Twitter, for example. Uh, I've spoken about, um, why don't we talk about music engineering as opposed to music theory? Because in a sense... Um, focusing on things that are much more, let's say, pragmatic, or things that are more directly audible, or things that actually go into how do you go about the nuts and bolts of putting a piece together, but not necessarily framing it in a, in a theoretical uh, manner. And um, that's something that I think is uh, important to spend a little bit more time on. Maybe we could, in, in that respect, we could talk a little bit about the role of analysis in, in all of this. Uh, musical analysis, uh, uh, musicology, what analysts can, can hope to accomplish uh, within, say, an academic framework. So if we could hop onto that topic for a second, what do you think the role of musical analysis is? What can, what can or should it do? And um, also, what is, the, what is the place of perception, of listening in, in music analysis? Something that comes immediately to mind with respect to that, there's the, the British musicologist uh, Derek Puffett has spoken about this. So there's a comment where he says, uh, he was sp speaking with a, a, a musicology student who was asking him, well, how, how do you go about um, analyzing a piece or, or writing a paper about a piece? Um, and the student's point of view was, well, the first thing, of course, I'll do is I'll gather all the sources, I'll read everything that's ever been written about the piece, and uh, I'll do an extensive, you know. And, and Puffett sort of looked at him blankly and said, well, what about listening? <laughs> Should that not be the first thing you do? And he said, uh, when I'm analyzing a piece, when I'm writing a paper about a piece, the first thing I do, I don't look at the score, I get a hold of a bunch of recordings, I listen to it 30 times, I make a mental map of the entire work, uh, so that I, I have a, a, an, an extremely detailed sense of its inner landscape. And then only at that point, when I've gone through the experience of listening to it many, many times, then I'll start to maybe look at the score a little bit, read some of the existing literature, and so on. So that, that's an extremely long question. Yeah. Well, that's and, and that's, uh, to some extent, a quite extreme position in terms of relationship. I'd be a bit more relaxed than that. Um, I mean, absolutely, I'm committed to music analysis. I am a trustee of the Society for Music Analysis there, and so involved, particularly involved in um, the administration of awards that we give to both academics and students in that respect. And I absolutely believe that in the broader sense of the term, music analysis should be embedded within musical education of all types. Um, now, for some people, music analysis implies the sort of varieties which grew up again in the early post-war years in the United States, which are often highly systematic, very score-based, and um, again, want, want to present themselves like they're some sort of objective science. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of very valuable work done in those domains, but I don't think that's the only approach. It interests me that, for example, the more supposedly scientific uh, varieties of Schenkerian analysis have had a lot more impact in the United States than they necessarily have had in the German-speaking world from which uh, Schenker himself came. And some of the same things are mirrored in neo-Romanian analysis, which is also uh, very sort of current now. Uh, once again, I'm not, I'm not saying this to uh, attack these fields. I think they're very important, but I would question uh, some of the claims for those being the most exclusively valid approaches to this. Uh, to me, analysis is really anything that involves engagement with the sounding music. And that, to me, is a defining aspect of musicology. That's what differentiates musicologists from people in other disciplines. If you were to look at the sociology of music, uh, the role of music in society, a uh, very, very important field of endeavour. But um, the question is, what can someone do that would distinguish them from a sociologist in that respect?
uh, sociologists will have a lot more training uh, and a lot more methodologies to draw upon in doing that rather than a musicologist uh, who will have been trained in a variety of other things. And I would worry a lot that if we end up turning, for example, musicology into a subset of sociology or a subset of anthropology, um, that sort of thing could potentially put uh, departments of music at risk. Because we could say, well, why don't we just sort of locate those people in those departments where they'll often be swallowed up uh, because what they will, they'll then be very small fishes in big ponds with other sociologists looking at many other things who may not necessarily see music as being a particularly fundamental concern. Being able to engage with sounding music, um, and yes, I emphasize the word sounding rather than necessarily notated because music analysis can certainly deal with non-notated traditions and often has done as well. That to me is uh, something of a bottom line and it's where I've come to coin the term, which not everyone likes, called musicology without ears, mm. where I've seen the increasing growth of types of musicology which can be done without ever having to listen to the music about which one is speaking, which doesn't always preclude people from making a lot of judgment on that music, but I think you have to listen to it and you have to engage with its oral qualities, not just about the life of the composer, not just about the listenership, uh, not just about the social or ideological context in which you came, but what these actually mean relative to the sounding result. And that relationship is not is not clear or unambiguous but, uh, by any means. Uh, it can often be very complicated. Uh, and I think one has to re-engage with that and the relationship between music and its context almost with every uh, new musical instance one comes across, rather than just assuming that one uh, informs the other in a one-way direction. And so, and that can only be done by some form of music analysis in the broader sense. But also where I think, I mean, I think a lot of people in the field of music analysis would uh, not disagree with this, that um, music analysis has been relatively slow in in coming to terms with performance as something itself to be analysed. Now, there is important work in this respect and has been for a while. Um, and certainly for a figure like Schenker, performance was all important and the relationship between analysis and performance was a central concern for him. So it'd be wrong to say that that was just a purely score-based thing. Um, there's an example that I wrote in one of my articles on Michael Finnessy recently. I was looking at someone else's analysis of a section from Cycle the History of Photography and Sound. Uh, a thing that's quite tonally ambiguous in various ways. Uh, and he was identifying certain sorts of uh, quasi-tonal harmonies and progressions in there. I don't, I don't disagree with those as one possibility, but I'd say the way he analyzed it in, uh, was done with the assumption of a certain way of playing it which would lend certain harmonies prominence over others. And I will demonstrate, in, if I do this in a lecture, I can demonstrate by playing it another way, how you might act, if you, if you heard it in a different way, played in, where, I mean, where you just have one dynamic over several systems of music, uh, but, and you, obviously a performer will want to uh, vary the touch uh, in different places, but how different things could actually lead to a different analytical result. And so a lot of score-based analysis certainly, as I say, for tonally ambiguous music, I think is analysis of a hypothetical performance. But there are other hypothetical performances, and those could uh, inform the analysis in itself. And I think that's something one should take account of in all types of analysis. I'm certainly glad you raised that point. And, and with the absolute necessity now of composers uh, producing recordings of their pieces in order to ensure that they have a, an adequate dissemination, that, that uh, question becomes incredibly important, I think. Um, Especially given that there are quite a lot of major works in the 20th and 21st century repertoire for which only a single recording exists. That's literally the only source that we have. So it, it would be, uh, you would think, um, uh, interesting at least to uh, to investigate the, the specific decisions that were made for for a given interpretation and see how does this color the result of the of the work. How does this color the work's reputation? There are some that still assume that in most contemporary music the performer's role is simply that of an uh, executor, simply following instructions and there's very little scope for uh, creative input on their own. I don't accept that at all and I don't even accept that in some of the most meticulously notated scores like those of Fernie Ho and others. Uh, and again this is something else I will demonstrate in some lectures uh, how I can take just a few bars 
of a very precisely notated uh, score, but say, but look at what decisions still remain there. Mm. Various things to do with voicing, to do with pedaling, to do with the type of touch, the type of legato. And that's just for a piano piece. If you're looking at a stringed instrument or a voice, the decisions become even wider. And then demonstrate how by different answers to those questions, which I do think are research questions, because interpretation questions uh, are of that nature, how that you can produce a very different type of sounding results, mm. even to the extent that one might perceive the whole nature of the music quite differently. Yeah, I, I think that's an extremely important point. Also, there's a sense that composers, when they're having their works performed, they sort of want to get a quote-unquote definitive recording where everything's in place, everything's exact, everything's accurate. Uh, and uh, having made quite a few recordings myself, there's this sense that we have to make sure that all the rhythms are precisely correct and all the pitches are exactly there and so on, because this might be the only recording of the piece. Um, and it leads you to this sort of um, micro-editing kind of approach to recording also, where um, there's this sort of emphasis on on producing a, a correct version of the text above everything else, above any other possible interpretive priorities. And I think that is certainly extremely dangerous. And that's one of the reasons that in, in my own practice, I've attempted to ensure that there would always be multiple versions of pieces available and to always encourage the performer to follow their own intuitions about what should be done with a given piece. Yes, that's part of the inevitable situation faced by composers, that the chances of being able to have multiple recordings of their music are going to be limited unless they're people of huge reputations. Uh, where we have seen that that happen, uh, I mean, obviously a piano example would be something like the Ligeti Etudes. Uh, uh, then, then I think people become much more aware of the range of possibilities that exist. But who would say that uh, there is a definitive recording of a Beethoven symphony, say? Mm. I, I, I always, I've always disliked the term definitive recording. It sort of implies a singularity, which to me is at odds with the, the, the creative and multifaceted nature of musical interpretation. Absolutely. But I think these are questions, just to bring this back uh, to higher education, I think these are sort of questions that those who are studying performance in a university context should be engaging with as well. And I think there's huge value for them in doing so. And that perhaps is something that it's easier to do in a university context where you have more opportunities to, to stand back from the very immediate demands of just being able to get something in a form where it can be played uh, towards being able to think more deeply about what's at stake in the process of playing it. Um, and that's where I do think things like uh, studying performance practice in, in the broader sense of the term. Uh, I don't I don't necessarily associate that with particular somewhat positivistic approaches to historical performance, which were quite current in the 60s and 70s, even though that field has moved on somewhat from that. Uh, but I mean, I suppose I could say the whole science of interpretation, the whole aesthetics of interpretation. And I do also believe that there's a lot to be gained by people working in different musical traditions, uh, learning from each other in this respect looking at the different role that a musical work has in different uh, things. I mean, I sort of hesitate before using the word work nowadays. I prefer to talk about the score. Mm. Um, but even the score has a different uh, function in different traditions. I mean, most obviously, a lead sheet for a jazz player gives the bare bones uh, to an extent which is not matched in many classical scores from the same time, but maybe matched in some scores of early music or even some Baroque music. Corelli, uh, for example. The, the, the scores yes. of Corelli are extremely skeletal. There's very little information. Yes. Uh, Dialogues I've had with various people involved in improvisation have been very interesting in this respect. Uh, not that we always agree. I mean, I, I question whether there's such a thing as something that's wholly improvised. That even if, for example, you know that you've got this and that instrument, and you've got an hour to do this in. That's already setting some boundaries around things. And, you know, a lot of improvised work does have some basic framework, which... And so the distinction between that and playing composed music I see as one of degree rather than one of fundamental nature. Mm. But th again, those are the sort of questions I think are very interesting for all types of performers to consider. And those playing notated music uh, can consider the extent to which they are wanting to pre-plan their interpretations. Uh, what's the role of spontaneity? What's the role of an ins instinctive response to the particularities of one singular performance uh, environment and situation? Uh, something which, again, is very 
important to me. It's something which differentiates live performance from recording. And there's a continuum between that and aspects of improvisation as well, I mm, believe. Absolutely. Ian, you published a, an article in The Spectator not long ago, a few months ago, that has certainly raised some eyebrows, in which you talk about the encroachment of sort of paramusical concerns into the musicological domain. What was the reaction to that article? And well, and before you get to that, what was the central argument that you were laying out in that piece? Well, I was approached by a commissioning editor at the periodical uh, who was aware that there had been some issues, controversies within musicology, which had started to be reported outside of specialist academic arenas and wondered if I would, might be able to write some sort of summary of these. And I said, I could certainly do that, but I'd like to actually give them a bit of historical context and say how I think these have arisen out of certain developments in academic music uh, and three things in particular which I wanted to focus on, one of which was the move in, in some musicals towards the direction closer to cultural studies. Uh, and this was particularly true with the study of popular music, uh, which was often looking a lot at the cultural context, maybe looking at the lyrics, uh, looking at what people wear, looking at all sorts of other aspects of music, but not, but sometimes actually the sounding music was uh, a minor concern, if it was a concern at all. It's certainly not true that, that, that all popular music scholars are like that. There are some who have done extremely brilliant work, including analytical work on popular music as well. But uh, I wondered about uh, the extent to which that development uh, was really taking musicology further away from what makes it uh, a profession in its own right. Um, Another area, and perhaps the one about which I had the most critical things to say, and I've written about in detail elsewhere, and I'm writing more at the moment, uh, has to do with ethnomusicology, a field, well, the term was coined in the early 1950s, but it grew out of a gleichen der Musikwissenschaft, uh, which was a discipline that's existed as long as musicology has, uh, looking comparatively at different musical traditions with a great focus on folk and vernacular ones and those from outside of the Western world. Um, ethnomusicology entailed a shift in emphasis away from a primary focus on the sounding music towards a, that on its social and cultural context. And in some cases, not all, but in some cases, uh, this could leave, again, the sounding music as at most a peripheral concern. And one was actually an ethnomusicologist himself, coined in terms of ethno-music. And I've seen, there's been a development which has grown since about the late 1980s, about which I've written in some detail, uh, the so-called ethnomusicology of Western art music, applying techniques uh, and approaches which were used in other cultural contexts to studying Western art music. But often I would say in a very loaded and agenda-driven way, and fundamentally using a particular approach to the methodologies that come from ethnography, which themselves come out of anthropology. And one thing I noticed is that there was a major critical debate about method about these in the wider ethnographic and anthropological fields, but very little of that had filtered its way into ethnomusicology. And I did find, and I've read most of the key texts in this tradition of ethnomusicology of Western art music, I did find a lot of uh, very problematic aspects of this. And I also found a field that I thought was very hermetically sealed and disengaged with other things, quite willfully disregarding other relevant scholarship, which is something uh, that's, that would be very heavily criticized in other ethnographic fields. Uh, and an awful lot which basically relies upon uh, anecdotal and unverifiable data um, and the tendency towards high moral judgment. Uh, um, so that was the second field. And the third, and oddly the one that perhaps seems most dated now, is the so-called new musicology, which also came about in the late 80s, um, claiming to sort of newly look at music in its social and ideological context. Now, I dispute that this was new. Uh, there's you, uh, you can find plenty of examples of work that's doing that uh, from a century beforehand, uh, right up to that time. But it can be fairly said that there was a shift in emphasis with the new musicology, and some of the concerns, particularly to do with gender and sexuality, were ones that had been only occasionally addressed in earlier stages. So I wouldn't deny that they were doing something new in that respect, nor would I deny uh, the value of that in principle. I would say, again, a lot of it was 
extremely morally loaded and sometimes substituted rather high-handed moral judgment for more nuanced possibilities. Uh, uh, but the new musicologists did, on the whole, still engage with sounding music. Uh, and some of their some of their social ideological conclusions were grounded in uh, detailed studies of scores and performances as well. And that differentiated it from the other fields. And that's actually one of the reasons I think that field may now seem to have dated somewhat. Um, in this Spectator article, uh, I related all of these things to, again, this uh, category that I call musicology without ears. And which has to be viewed also in the context of changing uh, student cohorts without, in many cases, not having the same level of formal training in theory and analysis that might have been the case uh, for earlier cohorts. Um, this, this faces educators with a dilemma. Do they try and provide some sort of new foundational training for those who don't have that, uh, which inevitably will eat up a certain amount of the curriculum and uh, would have to be gauged at a rather more basic level than would have been the case otherwise? Uh, or do you try and just find ways of teaching that can bypass that altogether? Ian, you published a piece that was quite a thorough review of a book by Lois Fitch about Brian Furniho, which touched upon a problem a pitfall in musicology, particularly with respect to contemporary music, which is that, of course, the composer is still alive. So there's this sense that you can consult the composer, you can interview them, you can review their own statements about their own work. And that can be, of course, a valuable source of information. It's possible for that to go too far, however, for the composer's claims, statements about their work to be simply presented as such without any kind of critical view. Your um, argument in that article was that that was an example of a writer that seemed to be going too far in that direction, where it becomes, there, there's a thin line at that point between analysis as such, between actual critical engagement with the work, and simply a kind of veiled promotional material, in effect. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I think that not just scholars, but even journalists and well, uh, have got a responsibility to do something more than just be mouthpieces uh, for their subjects. Um, of course, composers will talk about their works and performers as well in certain ways, which will probably uh, present themselves in a very good light. They will say that their music does this or that, but these things have to be independently evaluated. Um, if someone says, this is the greatest work uh, in the last 100 years, I wouldn't really expect a scholar to therefore say, yes, therefore, right. as if that's an objective fact, you know, they might want to have some means of assessing that. Uh, that's an obviously extreme example. Um, but, but, but similarly, uh, a lot of musicians are involved in constructing their own mythologies, constructing their own promotional materials, constructing their own images. And I think it's the responsibility of us as writing about them uh, to stand back a bit from those and uh, not necessarily reject them always, but uh, at least sort of critically evaluate them. Otherwise, I think what you have is, well, the category I always use is hagiography. And, and I think there's quite a fair amount of writing on new music that unfortunately at least comes close to that. Uh, and coming coming out of both the article you mentioned on Fitch and other things uh, I'd written on the subject, uh, I actually was involved in co-organizing a conference that took place in 2017 at Surrey University, which brought together people working on different art forms about the question of how do you write about living artists and how do you negotiate your relationship to them? Sometimes when you're dependent upon them for access to materials and good favor, but you might not always want to just write what they want you to write about them. And I, and I felt we needed, we needed to look more at the whole ethics and the methods of doing this. And what was really fascinating to find at this conference was the extent to which people writing about film, about dance, about literature, about visual arts had all come up against these same problems. Um, and if I brought this back to uh, the question of ethnomusicology and ethnography, because I wrote another article called rather polemical title, When Ethnography Becomes Hagiography, Uncritical Musical Perspectives. Mm. Um, I'm not saying all ethnography does this, but there is a tradition from ethnomusicological work looking at music from uh, 
from the developing world in which there's a clear power imbalance between uh, the musicologist come ethnographer and those about whom they write. And for various reasons, they would feel reticent about looking too critically at what their respondents have to say or their music. I totally understand where that comes from. I'm still not absolutely sure it's a good scholarly methodology, but I recognize uh, the problems, the limitations that have to be dealt with. When that approach is transplanted uh, into a non-colonial situation, in a situation where the power relationships are by no means so clear-cut in the same way, so if one's writing about uh, existing Western classical musicians or writing about audiences or even writing about academics or composers in this respect, if you take the same approach, then I think you can often get something that's extremely hagiographic. And that's unfortunately what I found in quite a bit of this ethnographic work. Uh, long text padded out with unmediated quotes uh, from the respondents, essentially reiterating just their own self-view without actually starting to look back or even develop the sort of contextual knowledge that would enable one to assess this. And I think that's uh, a very questionable scholarly value. Mm. Unfortunately, it, I mean, it's not that difficult to do in some ways. And even in the field of autoethnography, which is something else that interests me, and I, some of my, my own work, I think, falls into that category. So all these approaches which essentially bracket out uh, the scholar or the writer and reduces them to just simply being more like a reporter and obviate the need on their part to, to engage orally with the material, to engage critically with the area, I think those are ways in which scholarship becomes rather light. Mm. Well, Ian, that's perhaps a, a good note upon which to end this part of the discussion, which has been extraordinarily rich. And um, certainly anyone who's watching this who wants to know uh, more about what Ian does, you have a website where we can find you and your articles and links to your recordings. Yeah, uh, yes, I, my website's still being uh, redone. That's, that's, a bit, that's a bit overdue. Uh, that's simply um www.ianpace.com i also have a blog ianpace.wordpress.com where i i post articles regularly and i give some information on other things i do there and you're also uh, quite active on twitter yes so we'll, we'll put all of those links in the podcast description of course yes in this final portion of the interview, I'm going to do something that I, I've started doing actually with my interview with Hugues Dufour, where I started opening up the questions to my Patreon supporters. So just a quick word about that. So if, if you are watching this interview, if you are following my podcast, you, you probably know at this point that you have the option of becoming a patron, and that allows you to, among other things, ask questions of my guests, participate in question and answer videos. You can also submit your scores for calls for scores and many other things as as well. So if you'd like to get more involved in this burgeoning community of music lovers and professional musicians and, st and student musicians all over the world, please consider joining us at patreon.com slash Samuel Andreev. So here are some of the fascinating questions that came in uh, from Patreon, from people who would like to ask Ian specific questions. So this is from Bruno. Bruno asks if you could give an example of how the musicologist and the pianist interact in the classroom. How does wearing many hats affect your teaching? It affects, it affects it in a lot of ways, and I'm very acutely aware of these different hats. And in other roles, like being an administrator in a department, that's, an, that's a different hat again. If I am going to play a piece of music in a concert, I have to make myself believe in it somehow, if I'm going to put it across, convey it in a convincing way, I think, or I can do my best in that respect. To some extent, I need to suspend rather more dispassionate critical judgment at the time I'm doing that. If I'm teaching a piece, it's a quite different thing. I mean, if I'm teaching it in a classroom rather than in a piano lesson or something like that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm asking students to look uh, a bit more sort of, a bit deeper and a bit more critically at aspects of the music and its various meanings and everything like that. Uh, now, I will often play in the classroom um, and not just not just classical examples. So I don't I, I mean, what I teach, especially when I teach uh, music history is not is by no means exclusively a classical tradition. I teach a lot about popular music history as well. Um, so I will demonstrate a lot of things at the piano. And I think it's good to be able to do that rather than always just using recordings. But um, I think I, 
I, th I think even within different sub-disciplines of academic music, uh, one is wearing different hats. Uh, in the United States, you have this long-standing, almost opposition relationship between historians and theorists, uh, often in rival camps. And then there's ethnomusicologists as well. And I suppose you could say one is more engaged with the nuts and bolts of music, the other more with the context. Um, but I think separating those things out is not necessarily a healthy thing. Uh, I prefer a thing where those two things are in regular dialogue with one another. And then also in dialogue with performance and performers. It's a slightly roundabout way of trying to answer the question, but um, I do think having uh, experience at a professional level of being a musician uh, can very fruitfully inform what one does as an academic but on the other hand, I don't think doing the latter thing is simply an extrapolation from the former. I think the latter, the latter does involve some distinct skills, uh, some distinct uh, abilities and distinct perspectives, which are not necessarily things you would always expect of a performer. So once again, it's a question of dialogue and interaction rather than homogenization of these fields. And uh, it's the way in different hats... Uh, it's a particularly a challenge when, as we discussed before, writing about living composers. If there's someone who, I want to write a piece for me, or I want to recommend me to this festival as being the one to play their, their music. Um, if, on the other hand, I'm actually writing something about their work, which uh, might at least just be slightly mixed or slightly question some of their things, uh, then that's, that can be very much across purposes. And mm. that's a very difficult one to navigate. And I know there are, I know there are scholars who've worked on various living composers, and because of the tiniest critical comments, they found themselves pretty much frozen out from their circles. And there's a very brilliant essay coming, which will be coming out in a book, uh, another book I'm co-editing that came out of that conference, uh, a book by someone who's uh, studying the music of Olga Neuvert, uh, and has made a point of not really having any contact with her or her circle during this. And she's seen concepts and categories that permeate the work of other scholars, uh, uh, which come from the composer, but she doesn't necessarily believe uh, these are the optimal ones. It's not a criticism of the composer, it just thinks that there are different lenses through which to do, but feels that if you're within mm. that inner circle, there's a huge pressure on you to conform to a particular species of discursive practice about the composer. And I recognize that sort of pressure, and it's, particularly with my writing on Finnessy, this has been a very great challenge, because uh, I, don't, I don't want to just write hagiographic work about him myself. And I think some mm. of my own earlier work possibly uh, could be categorized as such, but I've tried to move away from that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a wonderful biography of Xenakis by Nuritza Matosian, uh, a lovely book actually, but one of the first things you read in the book is her description of how she was warmly welcomed into the Xenakis household and offered tea and given access to all of his documents and spent hours and hours and hours chatting with the composer and to the extent that he became almost like a family friend and so on. You see that sort of thing at the front of a, a biography and you kind of think, well, <laughs> how much objectivity will there be here? But of course, you, you can understand from her perspective, it would be extraordinary valuable also to have that kind of uh, intimate contact with with your subject yes and that's maybe the sum inevitability of this in the first writings about some composers and when a bit of time's passed it's easier for people to develop a bit more detached perspectives i mean i could say a lot about cage scholarship or about stockhausen scholarship or boulez scholarship in these respects uh, oddly i mean i think some Things, it's a rather polarized situation that exists. Uh, there's a lot of writing by people who are extremely close to the composers, extremely close to the field of new music. Again, they're having to operate in a particular world which does not necessarily value uh, critical engagement so much as demonstrating loyalty and adherence to certain ideas. For many practitioners who are also working as musicologists, that the attitudes that they are almost required to bring in to be able to engage in an external professional environment are very different from the values which I think make for a, a decent form of musicology. So, I mean, as time goes on, you'll start, you'll eventually start getting people who start to question a bit more uh, the composers and self view or some of the assumptions within the communities they inhabit. And I think that's very much for the better. But yes. It takes quite some strength of will to be prepared to do that and prepared to take on board the consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, Groupthink is a big thing in, a, in beleaguered fields. Uh, and new music is a beleaguered field in many ways. Other things are, I mean, even academic music is to some extent. Uh, and I think some 
subfields, not least ethnomusicology, uh, represent the sort of things that's been associated, uh, it's been found in subcultural theory, uh, that in certain subcultures you see a large degree of opposition to what's seen as the dominant mainstream, uh, but very little time for internal critique and internal dissent. And I think you can find that in various uh, species of musicology and within various sort of cultures of composition and performance. But I don't think that's healthy from an academic point of view. So I think being aware of these different hats and being aware of the different functions the hats serve is vital. And I think having that will give one a more broad and rounded and holistic approach to, uh, and understanding of the subject. So the second question comes from Ben, who says, my question for Professor Pace would be about what kinds of people are and aren't attracted to new music. I've noticed that in schools, there are many fine musicians, some of whom find modernist slash contemporary music intrinsically repulsive, and others of whom are drawn to it. What does Professor Pace think sets these categories apart? How does one, especially when teaching a broad survey course, get others interested in new music? Well, I think what draws people to new music may be as much a question of temperament and inclination as necessarily one of education. We hear a lot of people saying that uh, you need to have a high degree of formal education to be able to understand certain music. That doesn't uh, concur with my own experiences necessarily. I, I've talked about this before, you know, I just first heard, when I first heard certain works of Stockhausen, Cage, Nonna, etc. I, I just found them captivating in what you might say is a somewhat naive way. You know, I found the range of sounds they produced fascinating. I found the trajectory of the events, experiences that uh, they went through in their duration. I found those really captivating. I can't say I really knew what was going on necessarily. I didn't know how they were put together. I didn't even necessarily, I mean, I'm talking about when I'm really quite young here, have a sense of how these related to other traditions and so on. But there was something there that grabbed me, something that made me want to hear more and know more. And that still remains the case. And I mean, I can only speak anecdotally here, but I know for a lot of other people who are drawn to new music, um, I think it does come from that initial sort of more instinctive excitement rather than being taught to appreciate it. Um, that's not to say that that sort of level of more educated listening can't sort of yield its own sorts of fruits, but I think it usually needs that initial response in the first place. But what that's, in terms of what you do is when teaching it, I don't really see the role of uh, an educator, at least in a university context, as being, being one to, to put forward I'm not going to say not to put forward advocacy, because I do think advocacy can be valuable, but I don't see the view is to be a protagonist and try and convince the students uh, that this is good music. Rather, I, I do want them to hear it. I do want them to be exposed to it. And, you know, I do want them to spend a bit of time with it. But then, and, you know, and I want to give equip them with some of the critical tools which will enable them to articulate their own response to it. But that response may continue to be negative, And that is absolutely anyone's prerogative. Mm. And I, I think we can, as people like you and I are, who are very sort of personally engaged with new music, uh, it's, and particularly when we inhabit realms of other people who are strong believers, um, it's very easy to just sort of bracket out uh, the responses one can come across from a wider public, which can often be very negative. And over a hundred years on, major works of Schoenberg have not in any real sense entered a mainstream repertoire. They're still, they're still niche to an extent which you wouldn't say, say of the three great ballets of Stravinsky. Um, I think to use in the broad sense of the term atonal music, and that includes things like noise music in that category, but it does appeal to a certain inclination, which seems to be a minority and niche thing. And I, I know that many lay listeners might express their views in rather less polite or diplomatic language. They'll say that's not music or something like that. You know, and I hear students say, saying that sort of thing. Uh, and I don't really want to sort of start preaching that they, that they have to be taught to appreciate this. I don't, I think they're perfectly entitled to their view. But I think it, it raises difficult questions relating to the 
place that new music has within university departments, which is in part related to these questions of what uh, is most amenable to being presented as research, when there can be, as I say, this disjunction between what academics think is important and what some of the desires of students can be. The scholar Nicholas Cook has written about this uh, uh, on various occasions. He said that new music has a representation uh, in academic departments, which is quite out of proportion, at least in the UK, quite out of proportion to the interest there is amongst students. And, I mean, his his uh, response to that is to advocate for a greater sort of amount of popular music in departments. Now, I'm not, I, I'm not going to argue against that. I think there's every reason to teach about popular music and, you know, uh, popular music as a global and historical thing, uh, which has many manifestations uh, in, in different contexts as well. Um, but uh, I think ultimately, if we think the view, the task of educators is to try and win round people for new music, um, will there'll probably be a few successes, but I think that's a bit of a losing battle. Yeah, well, it's partly it's partly a fundamental dimension of personality. Some people are exceptionally high in openness, which openness to new experience, which means that they'll have an easier time um, being excited about um, about uh, a new musical work. Uh, and but most people aren't um, aren't on that end of the distribution, really. So it's it, this, this, and there's not much you can do about that. You can't really change people's personalities. You can, with extreme difficulty, you can get them to modify their behavior, but forget about changing people's personalities. And so it's it's a hopeless battle, isn't it? This is an issue uh, with some aspects of looking at music in a historical sense as well. Um, I, as I say, I, I mean, I, when I teach uh, Western musical history, that includes the history of popular music within that. I mean, I teach them about the mid 19th century to the present day, but things like 1940s rhythm and blues uh, or 1920s Berlin cabaret, which I would classify as popular music, can be about as remote or obscure to many students as as some works of Keijo Bula's mm. might be. And I worry uh, about what I would call a, a presentist attitude, which, I mean, this is particularly true in the case of popular music, that sort of um, views only stuff of the very recent present as being relevant and valid. I don't see any reason why something that happens to be quite current or happens to be quite prominent or successful now should be viewed as more important, more relevant than something from several decades ago. Um, but that, again, ultimately, you can't totally try and stampede over the natural inclinations of students. So there's one last question that came in from Patreon that I'll put to you. So Jacob writes, hi, Samuel, this isn't to do with higher education, but if there's time, I'd like to know Pace's feelings on the role of recordings in absorbing and appreciating music, especially complex pieces of the sort that he specializes in. I don't think I'm an unusual in finding music more enjoyable when I've heard it a few times and can begin to predict its contours. But to get to this point can take quite a lot of effort. And I wonder if most people simply don't bother. Assuming that's the case, how does he feel about playing to an audience who are likely hearing a piece for the first time? Can he get a decent sense of a complex piece without hearing it a few times? If so, what does he listen for? Well, Brahm said something about this, uh, about how he would actually think you can play music in a different way when it's, it's become more familiar. And when it's very new, there are certain things to try and foreground in a performance uh, to make it a bit more immediate to an audience uh, with that. And that's an approach which is meaningful to me when I'm playing something, when it's a world premiere, or I'm playing it to an audience where I know the chances of many of them having encountered this sort of music before are pretty slim. Then there are certain aspects of music, certain parameters, things that I think will be most immediate, uh, which I might sort of accentuate to some extent, which I wouldn't feel the same need to do uh, in a different context. The point about recording, I mean, absolutely, recordings are really important as a means of getting to know music uh, more integrately, stuff that does yield up many things upon repeated listenings. Um, but they're not a substitute uh, for live performances. That's not to say that they're inferior, but they're a different thing. And I think it's important to have the chance to hear things live multiple times. And there is a problem, I think, with a new music culture that's very focused upon uh, world or regional premieres, uh, that once the festivals of the concert series have been through the rounds of the latest premieres, they move on to the next ones. And there isn't so much chance for things to be heard more regularly over a sustained period of time, uh, so that people can derive a greater familiar, familiarity with them um, 
in live performance. I mean, there are some uh, events where that does happen, but I think there could be more of that. And I suppose I'd say we should not make too much of a fetish of the absolutely new, because a lot of things can remain new in other ways, um, even a long time after they were created. Um, I'm not sure I would say that listening to some Josquin masses constitutes an experience fundamentally less new or less relevant or more conservative than listening to some recent studio composition. Mm. Well, thank you, Ian, for these extraordinary insights, this, uh, this very, very broad tour through your activities on multiple dimensions. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions via Patreon. Please, again, remember, if you appreciate the work that I'm doing, you can help me keep on doing it by becoming a member on Patreon. And there are many, many uh, bonuses that I'm offering in exchange for that. So Ian, is there, before we stop, is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? Well, I wouldn't mind indulging in a little plug of my own here for a conference on uh, music and the university, which of which I'm a co-organizer, which is taking place here at City University between the 7th and the 9th of July. Registration is about to go live for this, in which we've got a very wide range of uh, speakers from multiple continents all talking about uh, various issues relating to the role of music in higher education as we faced it today. So I just really like to recommend people register and come along and hear the various papers. It's sure to be very interesting and there'll be there's various sessions that I think will provoke plenty of comment. Lovely. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you.